on Bills Live, presented by Kaleida Health. Hour number two here on a Wednesday. Chris Brown, Steve Tasker with you talking Bills initial 53-man roster. We're expecting some tweaks and here to discuss some of the initial decisions made by the Bills personnel and coaching staff departments is our good friend from NFL Films, the senior producer, Greg Cosell. Greg, how you doing? Brownie, Steve, what's happening? Oh, you know, just a little roster juggling here and there uh, and probably a little bit more before it's all said and done. What do you expect, Brownie? What do you think's going to happen? Well, Reed Ferguson has got to get back on the roster. They had him off of it just for a little roster juggling maintenance. So we're expecting some players to get IR'd to create some space. I'm sure you've seen the reports that the Bills are expected to sign Jermaine Effetti, uh, the I veteran offensive tackle. So that'll fortify the ranks there. And since we are talking tackle, Greg, let's talk about the ascension of one Ryan Vandemark. The UConn product <laughs> played three years of left tackle at UConn, yep. was on the practice squad here last year, worked with Aaron Cromer for over a year, and rocketed up the depth chart through the course of the summer to not only make the 53-man roster, but to unseat last year's swing tackle, David Quessenberry, who didn't even make the 53-man squad. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, to be honest with you, and other than watching him in the preseason, I did not know much about Vandermark. I had to look up his background and saw that he was a three-year starter in college. But seeing him in the preseason, you know, and I think we discussed him a week or so ago, length, yeah. athleticism, moves well, certainly has the traits you look for at the position. Um, now, again, in an ideal world, you are you know, you probably don't want him to be your starter given what they do have, but I guess we'll see how this plays out. Dawkins is certainly entrenched at the left tackle position. My guess is that there are some question marks about right tackle at this point in time as to how that, you know, plays out. Uh, because the one thing we all know is that you'd like to get five out and not have to keep someone in to help your right tackle and pass protection, particularly on third down. So we'll see how all that plays out. But, yeah, Vandermark is, certainly looks the part. He's got tremendous length, long arms, long body, good feet. Um, it, it, it's a good story. And obviously Aaron Cromer has been doing this a long time, so he obviously feels very good about him. Yeah, we and the the question mark seems to be Spencer Brown, and he was a, a roller coaster yep. last year. He, he spent the whole off season recovering from a a minor back in, a back surgery that he had. Then he comes in, gets a high ankle sprain. Never seemed to find his stride last year, and it was a little bit. And it was is it fair to say it was like a roller coaster last year. He'd have really good reps and bad reps. You know, it was just yeah. both ends of the spectrum, and that's really what you you hate to see. You know, in the offense, you'd rather have the guy at least at a level where you know how much you've got to help him from play to play. But that well, seems to be a problem with Brown, right? The other thing, too, Steve, and, and this is just the nature of your quarterback. I mean, Josh Allen's a great quarterback. That's not the point. But he's a certain kind of quarterback. You know, Josh Allen will have a tendency to leave the pocket at times before he has to. And, and he makes special plays doing so. And he'll probably always be that kind of quarterback to some extent. And when it's his front side and he would see someone you know uh, the pass rusher the edge pass rusher look like they're beating brown you know josh would move and you know so the, the nature of your quarterback and a right tackle that was up and down as you said and the tape showed that because i ended up watching a ton of josh allen dropbacks about uh, two three weeks ago you know the tape showed that that brown would often initially get beat and Josh could see that because it's in his, you know, it's his front side, and that would cause him to break down at times before he had to. And you don't really want to be in that situation. Uh, moving to the other side of the ball, another former practice squatter who made the 53 man roster, Greg Kingsley Jonathan, the Syracuse product, undrafted rookie, signs with the Bills last year, gets plucked off their practice squad, plays five games in Chicago. They cut him last year. The Bills managed to get him back on their practice squad for the duration last season, comes in this year, has an advanced repertoire of pass rush moves, uh, had a great sack against the Steelers in preseason game number two where he flattened after beating the man on a rip move. And then last week has a left arm stab on the left tackle and then spins back underneath the pass rush arc and almost gets to Justin Fields. Just your thoughts on the advances that Kingsley Jonathan has made in his game to make a spot on the 53. 
Yeah, great story, too, because as you start looking at his history, he's, you know, one of those guys that seems like he's, you know, free agent, then he's waived, then he's claimed, then he's waived, then he's, you know, he's one of those guys. Really good length uh, for the position. You know, he could play inside or outside, um, you know, and I, and again, obviously, those kinds of players are, I think, are important to um, to Sean McDermott. You know, I think players who can line up inside or outside, and and obviously he's going to be a rotational player. He's not going to play 60 snaps a game. But I think they're looking for pass rush, you know, until Von Miller gets back, which I guess the earliest would be the fifth game of the season or the fifth week, right? Right. Yep. Based on, yeah. So, um, you know, and, until he comes back, you're looking for pass rush. In an ideal world, I think they would prefer not to have to pressure a lot, although with Sean calling the defense – you know, depending on on what he sees, his background certainly comes from a Jim Johnson in Philadelphia back uh, back in the day, and he was a very big blitz guy. So you don't know how this will play out when the regular season starts. Um, but if you don't want to blitz, you need your front four obviously to exert meaningful, consistent pressure on the quarterback. At least speed him up if you don't sack him. So Jonathan could be a guy that fits that. The other thing I'm curious about, Brownie, and I don't know if you're going to go there with this. What kind of camp, because uh, I'm not there every day, you guys are, what kind of camp did Leonard Floyd have? Uh, I was just going to ask you about him. What In the past, he's been a, like a nine and a half, ten sack, or you know, right at nine, nine and a half sacks every year. He came in and seems to have, you know, kind of solidified his spot there. We're going to ask you what about his production. Uh, he seems to be behind Rousseau for the time being and behind Von Miller when he's out, out there. Yeah. But he's got those, he's long and got a lot of traits and yeah i think we've got some expectations for him i think they kind of paced him through training camp greg they really didn't give him a crazy amount of reps because i think after the spring and then the first week of camp i think they were like okay he's checking all the boxes he is what we thought he was let's look at some of these younger guys that they had to get a handle on like a kingsley jonathan or a cameron klein and so he was kind of paced through training camp the reason I asked is because, you know, and and Steve just hit upon it, um, he's never become, I think, what people might have hoped because I think he was a top 10 pick initially, but he's long, he's athletic, he looks the part, he's had moments in this league where you said, wow, that's pretty good. And, and the reason I mentioned him is if he can play, particularly in your pass rush situations, maybe he's not a full-time starter, and he probably won't be, but if he can come in in your sub fronts and play on the edge, my question becomes this. Does Rousseau in your sub fronts, does he move inside? And do you have Miller and Floyd on the edge? Because Rousseau, people may not remember this, but I obviously studied Rousseau coming out of the University of Miami. And at the University of Miami, Rousseau played inside a lot on third downs and was very good at it. And he's got tremendous length and tremendous leverage. And again, he's played almost exclusively on the outside for the Bills in his uh, two years, I guess. Is he a two-year yeah. player? Yeah. Keep talking about year. it, though, yeah. Greg, because Greg, you're, we've, we've, you're speaking my turbo package into yes. existence. So have at it. Yeah, we've well, been, that's, I mean, again, I you know, it's not like, uh, you know, I'm on speed dial with Sean or anything, but, you know, if Floyd can be an edge pass rusher because he certainly looks the part, we know Von Miller is coming back, and you bring Rousseau inside, and, you know, maybe you get a better four-man pass rush and you're able to play and do, you know, do a lot more in coverage. Yeah, we we have spoken at length on the show about the exact same thing. When Rousseau came out, oh, you saw a lot of film of him on the nose. You know, that he was right correct. down inside, and... Uh, you know, at six seven, which is what he is in long and lean, um, a guy like Tua, um, somebody, the smaller stature quarterbacks are going to have this guy right in their face with his arms up. Um, I mean, think of a guy like DeForest Buckner, who's six seven, or yeah. really, really good defensive tackle. And you know, those guys they stick their arms up, and man, they they, they got a lot of length to them. Yeah, it's it's going to be a problem. And you you said it. I mean, Brownie and I were thinking about the exact same thing when Lloyd when Leonard Floyd showed up as to what would happen when Vaughn came in and put Floyd on the outside and then just move him down with Ed Oliver down inside as well, who is a penetrator. It seems to be a really nice package of, of pass rushes with a lot of speed and, bend and you know, ability to get the corner. And look, you know, the bottom line is to this point in time, I know they signed Oliver, okay, but, you know, he's a, he's a shorter guy. And at this point in time, he's not really shown to be a pass rusher per se. So 
you, you know, we talked about someone like Kingsley Jonathan. He's six four. You know, what happens if, and again, I'm just throwing this out. We don't know anything right now, and I want that to be clear. We don't really know anything. All right. we're doing is talking, talking ball, you know, like a bunch of guys sitting around the bar talking ball. But, I mean, let's say you had Floyd and Miller on the outside and Rousseau and Jonathan inside in your sub. You know, you got speed off the edge. You got size inside. Uh, who knows? I mean, you know, all this has to get worked out. Yeah. Right. And I'll just uh, make water the seed that you just planted by telling you that Greg Rousseau worked with DeForest Buckner and Eric Armstead this offseason in there Charlotte you go. and down at Clemson. So could be an indication on where he might be lining up at least part of the time this season for the Bills. I, mean, I wanted to talk an to you about an Go ahead. I was just going to say, that's really interesting, though, Brownie, because I wonder if he did that, like if the organization mentioned anything about it to him to do that, or if he just did that on his own. Because, you know, obviously those guys, you know, Armstead's played inside and outside. Buckner is, is an exclusive inside player, but they're both six 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 seven. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. I, I think body types are somewhat similar, so maybe that was the impetus yeah. behind it, but it's still interesting nonetheless. I wanted to talk to you about... Buffalo's cornerback situation, they are they are deep there in terms of capable talent, you know, with yeah. the two draft choices from last season, along with Dane Jackson and Tredavious White. Steve and I were knocking this around the other day, and I'm curious if you have uh, a working knowledge of how prevalent this could be. But we were talking about how it, it looks, at least going into this week and week one next week, that Christian Benford may have eked out Dane Jackson for the starting corner job opposite Tredavious White. But clearly you have two corners behind the two projected starters with starting experience, with uh, a body of work that shows they are capable of making plays. And we were kind of throwing around the idea and the notion that, hey, you know what? In a given week, a given matchup might make it a good idea to put Kyrie Elam man-to-man -man on a guy and have him follow somebody all week and maybe somebody else steps out of the starting lineup so Elam can execute that assignment I just I guess what I'm getting at Greg is these four corners top to bottom to me there isn't a tremendous amount of separation between them I think that's part of what made the cornerback two battle here so difficult to discern and pick a winner so with that in well, mind I'm wondering how prevalent it is around the league to kind of maybe spot start a corner in a given week from the guy that you normally have out there playing 50, 60 snaps a week. Well, you normally, I mean, just you normally don't see that, Brownie. I mean, again, that doesn't mean it can't happen. I was going to ask you guys, and I'm glad you brought this up, what is going on with Kyrie Elam? I mean, because, I mean, I've seen the preseason games, and, you know, has he gotten beat a few times? You know, yeah, but not badly where you went, oh, my God, that guy can't play. So something's going on there through camp. I mean, has he not performed well? I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, there are instances where he might get a little grabby. We saw that in the Pittsburgh game uh, down in the end zone. But really, it was an inconsequential yeah. penalty in the end zone because the team was the Steelers were already on the two yard line. It was essentially a one yard penalty that you take, but it was on a third and goal. So you don't want to do that on a third and goal from the two and give them first and goal at the one. Yeah, it's a one-yard penalty, but it's also a fresh set of downs. So recognition of down and distance, time and score, I think those are things that he's got to focus on more than his ability to play the football game. And I think one more thing that we talked about a little bit is that I, I don't know that it's – they like all four of these guys a bunch. Tredavious, Dane Jackson, Kyrie Ky Elam, and Christian Benford. They all have a different feel. And I think right. there's some I think there's some difference of opinion on the staff about which one they think is a better fit or you know the bigger upside as opposed to the steady player kind of thing. Uh, I think there's some of that going on as well because I think they like all of those guys and Taron Johnson, of course. So I like well, they like you say that because Brownie, when you were talking a, a moment ago about you know week to week, I started thinking of Bill Belichick and the way you know he would some, some weeks he could play guys and the next week a guy could be you know he could be inactive and and the next week he, he could be a starter. Now I'm not suggesting that's going to happen here, but I don't know if if they really like all these guys, maybe it is possible that it becomes a opponent specific who they're playing, how much man they want to play versus how much zone. You know, there's so many factors as you guys know that go into it, um, but uh, you know. Look, Tredavious White, he's 
I would doubt that he would ever sit, but you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I would doubt that. But then, so then I think you're dealing with the three other guys and how they might play out, you know, depending on who they're playing. Yeah. I mean, I Mm -hmm. think Benford had the best body of work through the course of the preseason. He was probably the most consistent of the three that were competing. And then, you know, I think Dane Jackson's just kind of like a steady Eddie player. At times he shows a nose for the football. Kair is the most physically gifted of the three. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what kind of gets me because I, I keep seeing this in my head. Last year in the playoffs, Bills Dolphins up here, wild card playoff game. Tyreek Hill runs an 18 yard dig route, and Kyir Elam is with him every step of the way. And after the play, Tyreek Hill actually turns around like who the heck was with me stride for stride on an 18 yard comeback that never happens. Like he was right, shocked. Right. And so I think right. about that just what I know it's just one play, but now it makes me think like, Hey, we're game planning for the dolphins. We got Waddle and Tyreek Hill to worry about. Why would we not put our best physically gifted corner on one of these guys as a game plan for the game? No, it, I mean, it, it's possible. You just, you know, that becomes a coaching decision and a philosophy and, you know, I don't think any of us can answer that right now. Right. Um, the other question I was going to ask you guys, if they had a line up and play tomorrow, who's the linebacker next to Milano? Yeah, I think it's Tyrell Dodson. That's our ca- That's our guess. Yeah, I, I think Bernard missed the entire preseason. He just got back on the practice field today and is not all the way back from the hamstring injury. To me, I don't know how you feel about this, Greg, but I think there's a couple of reasons why it, it's got to be Dodson. And look, he's he's got his strengths and he has his drawbacks to his game. Um, but I think he gives you just a little bit more than than A.J. Klein does, who's not on the roster right now. We'll see if he winds up on the Bills practice squad as veteran insurance. Um, number one, I just think Bernard missed way too much time to be considered right now for the starting job. And I think if you if Bernard has this recovery this week and then – you know, can practice fully next week, and then you put him in the starting lineup, I think it's an insult to Tyrell Dotson because you're basically rendering his entire preseason meaningless. And I, if right. I'm Tyrell Dotson, I'm like, what the heck did I do for the last three games? Why was I busting my hump to earn this job when you were just going to give it to this guy anyway who did nothing in the preseason? I think it's a bad look. And he played a, a bad lot of snaps, Dotson, too. And Dotson yeah. played a lot of snaps, so they, yeah, they wanted a, to see him play. Yeah, I think that kind of decision would be a, a bad look in the locker room, if, if you will. So that's not to say that Terrell Bernard couldn't be the starting middle linebacker by week four, but I think right now for week one, it, it, I think it's going to be Dotson. What's your sense of Dorian Williams and his, and his uh, preseason and training camp? I thought he had a great preseason. I, I thought he was very productive. It was a shame he missed the last game with the calf injury because he was really on the ascent there. I mean, he was the leading tackler in both games for this team, you know, from the will position – I know at the end of one of those preseason games, they moved him back over to Mike a little bit. But as of right now, we're not getting the sense that he is part of that equation yet. Yeah. I would tend to think it's, it's going to kind of go based on how either Dotson and or Bernard look. And if they don't fulfill all the responsibilities of that role, he could shift back yeah. there. I wouldn't rule it out. I think the thing about Dorian Williams is – yeah, he, it was a little bit too much for him early on. He and with everything that's going on in your first training camp, and you're trying to grab it all. I think they felt like it was too much on his plate to to give it to him, uh, both the Mike and the Will. So they I mean, gave the him the thing Will. Him without you know, without knowing how he's taught. You know, obviously it's different from when he was taught at Tulane. It's a whole different deal. Right. But he definitely and and I, I hate to sound cliched, Steve, but you know exactly what I'm talking about because you played with guys like this. He is definitely a see ball get ball guy. I mean, right. He he may make a mistake, I'm sure. You know, when they chart every snap, but he is around the football and he makes tackles. Yeah, and that's what I think they see. But I, I think in the beginning, they didn't want to overload him mentally and want to let him play like that, see ball get ball with making fewer mistakes. And yep. now that he's been in it for a month and a half, now they're starting, you know, like you said, they gave him a minute at the mic uh, where he'd been backing up Milano for a whole training. Well, you got to trust him. I mean, you know how it is with defensive coaches. Both of you guys know you've been around the game. That's a word you hear all the time from defensive coaches. It's why sometimes guys with lesser talent play because they can trust them to do the right thing on every play. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. They yep. got to know you're going to – because and particularly playing Mike – 
you doing what you're supposed to do makes all the other 10 guys do what they're supposed to do because yeah. you're the guy talking to them and making the key, you're making the adjustments in the adjustment packages. And if you're not on it, something's going to go haywire and somebody's going to be running free with nobody on them. Last That's one we correct. had last one we had for you, Greg. Um, Hardy and Sherfield, two of the new more prominent additions to the receiving core. I think we were very encouraged by what we saw uh, from those two through the course of the preseason. From Hardy in particular in this last preseason game against Chicago, we saw how Ken Dorsey, at least we got indication of how he wants to get him out in space in a variety of different ways, knowing what he can do when he has space available to him in terms of getting yards after the catch. Um, well, just based up, what has the preseason told you about how those two can help this passing game? Well, the other thing, too, is Hardy was with, with the um, Saints. And the year that Jameis Williams started with the Saints and before he got hurt, you know, week seven or eight, he hit Hardy on a couple of deep bombs. That kid can run. And obviously, you got a quarterback that can throw at the length of the football field. So to have a guy that can really run as well, besides being very good run after catch, whether you're talking jet sweeps or tunnel screens, but this kid can run and get over the top. So, you know, I think you'll see some specific plays for him because he's got a track record, Brownie, in the league. I've seen him. Um, you know, in Sherfield, I always thought Sherfield was just a really solid kind of number three type receiver. I can remember last year, I think it was the first play of the game against the 49ers. The yep. 49ers made a defensive mistake in coverage, and he caught a probably a 12-yard in-breaking route, and he took it to the house for a 75-yard touchdown. He's always been a solid receiver. Um, you know, one of those kinds of guys that I think every team needs. Like, I'm, he's certainly a different receiver than, let's say, a Cole Beasley stylistically. But, you know, he, I think he's one of those guys you can trust on third down, and I think every team needs that kind of guy. And we heard from Brandon Bean that, you know, and we told you that most of the guys in the bottom of the roster be behind Steph Diggs and Gabe Davis and Hardy and Isabella and, uh, and Shakir, the guys they brought in were all big, really big. Yeah. And sure, sure feels a little bit bigger as well. I mean, he's six foot yes. and stuff. But, and they kept shorter, who's uh, almost six four. That's right. So, but Brandon Bean told us Sean, uh, that Josh Allen seems to like littler guys because of the way they separate in tight spaces. You know, the the quick. So he they're like they're like like he loved Cole Beasley, he liked John Brown, he liked those guys like that, and he continues to like to like uh, Hardy, and he liked Isabella in the preseason as well. So um, I don't know that. It, we were raised our eyebrows. They had three guys from all the receivers they had last year: Shakir, Davis, and Diggs. As the only guys in the room that are the same as last year, that gave us some hesitation going into training camp. But I think these guys that they have got with Sherfield and Hardy seem to be the right guys. Well, we'll find out. It's getting to be that time, guys. Uh, yeah. They open with the Jets Monday Night Football. The uh, the nation will be watching. They will indeed, and we'll be previewing that with you next week. Uh, thanks very much for the time, as always, Greg. As I said, we'll catch up with you in week one. We finally made it. Back to the start we of the regular season, and your film watching begins. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Look forward to next week.